scripture reading that God wrote in John 20, 11 through 13. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I do not know where they have put him. So Verses 1 through 5 says, On the first day of the week, 
Very early in the morning, the, woman, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes, they gleamed like lightning, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? So they did not understand this. Jesus Christ came to this earth to die, but also to be raised again for the completion of His task that the Father sent Him. To die for our penalty for our sins so that we could be reunited with God forevermore. You look back in the Old Testament, turn to Exodus chapter 3, we're going to look through some chapters right there where the Old Testament law talked about the forecoming of Jesus Christ. What was necessary for the atonement of sin? God required blood. He required a blood sacrifice as payment for the sins of mankind. In Exodus 23, starting in verse 20, we read, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you. We see an angel again. You see, angels are messengers of God. They obey God. They bring forth His commands. They're here to protect us, to, to tell us, to look over us. They obey God. I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. So what did he say in Luke? Luke, why do you look for the living among the dead? We serve a risen Savior. That, what, that is what makes a difference in Christians and every other religion in the world. We serve a risen Savior. You go and find the tomb and it is empty for our Lord is not there. Pay attention to Him and listen to what He says. Do not rebel against Him. He will not forgive your rebellion, since My name is in Him. If you listen carefully to what He says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God. You see, the problem with the Israelites is no different than the problem today. We don't worship only the Lord, do we? We worship creations. We listen to the, the prince and the power of this world, which is Satan, who tries to deceive us, to distract us from becoming saved, but also as Christians to live a life that is not worthy, a life that is not holy and set aside as God intended for us. So God establishes His covenant with His people. That means that He won't break His covenant. He keeps His promises. Praise God. doesn't matter what we do. In fact, He gives us more and more mercy and more and more grace. If you flip over to Exodus chapter 24, starting in verse 3, when Moses went and told the people all the Lord, Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice unanimously, everything the Lord has said we will do. Right? That's what we say. That's what we strive for, but we so many times fall short. Moses then wrote down everything that the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve stone pillars representing the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he, then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it into bowls and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said we will obey. But again, we fall short. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. That he would provide for them, that he would care for them, that they would be his people. Not because anything they did, but because God chose this people. And God chooses to send His Son to die for the sins of the world. No one can ever say, how can a loving God, because how can a loving God not? That He would send His very own Son to die for those that are His enemies. That all they have to do is believe in Him and that they will be saved and reunited back with God into a loving relationship as father and child. So we're given instructions about the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25. It contained the law of God. 
the law that we could not obey, that was a standard set forth. If any man could obey that law, then he could be justified in God's sight. But we can. In Exodus 25, starting in verse 10, have them make an ark of a kale, a cake of wood, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold mold, molding around it. Cast four golden rings for it and fasten them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of a cake of wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark, and they are not to be removed. Then put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law, which I will give you. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one and a second cherub on the other. Now what's a cherub, right? But an angelic being. Okay, we'll leave it that we can get in further. But we've got angels again, right? Make the cherubim one piece with the cover and the two ends. Verse 20. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking towards the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. There above the covenant, I mean, there above the cover between the two cherubim that are that are over the ark of the covenant law, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. So the Israelites carried that Ark of the Covenant in front of them with the law so that it would be ever representing of what God demanded of them, that He had called them out to be a chosen people. In Leviticus chapter 16, if you want to turn there, we're going to learn a little bit about what happens when the high priest makes atonement for our sins. It was lots of details involved, but I'm not going to go into the depth of it. We're just going to read a couple things about it. In verse 3, it says, This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. Dropping down to verse 15, He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people, and take its blood behind the curtain, and do with it, with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and on front of it. In this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites whatever their sins may be. No matter what their sin is, they can still come and approach God because of the sacrifice, the blood that was poured out on the atonement cover, the mercy seat, as propitiation for our sins, to appease God because we are not righteous and holy, but He is. And we can come to into His presence because of what the priest did. Verse 34 says, This is to be a lasting ordinance for you, Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. But see, we get to be grafted in. Because of their rebellion and stubbornness, God grafted the Gentiles into the vine. He said, salvation will be to all men. God chose us as a people, just like He chose the Israelite nation. All we have to do is accept what Jesus Christ did for us. We can't do anything, so God provided the way Himself. He required a blood sacrifice, and it would be the sacrifice of His Son, who came to earth, and the angels announced that. It was a night, and the angels came and announced the birth of the promised Messiah, the one who would save the people from their sins, because He would pour out His blood once and for all on the mercy seat. We don't have to worry about any other high priest coming out, because Jesus will be our high priest. He is our high priest forevermore. Because all have sinned and all fall short of God's glorious standard. So now let's go to the New Testament. In John chapter 20, verse 11 through 13, it said, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look inside the tomb and saw what? Two angels, right? In white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put them. Did you notice where the angels were sitting? One at the foot, one at the head, just like the mercy seat. The blood of the Lamb of God, the Christ, Jesus, was poured out 
Just like the mercy seat representation in the Old Testament, the angels were sitting like that on the tomb saying, God has accepted this sacrifice once and for all. Jesus' blood was poured out and spilled for you, and God has accepted it and raised Him from the dead. That means that you too, when you die, you have nothing to fear because Jesus has paid the price. God has accepted His sacrifice and you can forever be His child. <clears throat> Romans 3.25 says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. God will punish all sin because He is holy and just. And praise God that He is because that means heaven will be a perfect place. We just have to accept. We have to realize what Jesus did. We have to follow after Him. We have to let the Spirit lead and guide us through this life. After all, it's what we're working for. The end result of our salvation is our eternity with God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. It's what we're living for. We're not living for this world. We're living for that future world to come. In Hebrews, I challenge you to read Hebrews. And maybe it'll be a little bit more about what we talked about today. But in Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 14, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, He too shared in their humanity, so that by His death we might break the power of Him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who who all their lives have been held by slavery, by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels He helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason we had to be, He had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that we might become a merciful and fa faithful high priest in service to God, and that He might make an atonement, a satisfaction and appeasement for the sins of the people. Jesus is that new covenant. His blood seals that covenant. You can trust without a doubt that God will accept you as His child if you accept Jesus. You have nothing to fear. That's why we can say when we are facing cancer or facing anything else in life, that if we are saved, we know exactly where we're headed. We don't have to worry. Sure, selfishly, we might want to stay behind. Our friends might want us to stay behind. But the end result of our salvation is coming to the Heavenly Father forever and ever for all eternity. And he did that all through Jesus Christ. Reading on Hebrews 8, verse 7 through 13. For if there had been nothing wrong with, the first, with that first covenant, nothing wrong with God, it was us, right? No place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people. We couldn't live up to the covenant. And said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will not be like, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the new covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after the after that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, for the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive the wickedness and remember their sins no more. What a fabulous, fabulous phrase. God doesn't look at us as unrighteous, as unclean, as sinners. If we believe in Jesus Christ, He looks at us through the lens of Jesus, spotless, blameless, forever His children. You probably have all participated in the Lord's Supper. In Luke 22, 20, Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's very specific about it, which has been poured out each and every one of you here. Whether you are a child or whether you're a child and you're wandered off, He stands there saying, I sent my Son to die for you. Will you just come to Me? That's all we've got to do. And He is faithful and just because of the covenant that He made through His own Son's blood. 
In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 through 16, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He is our Father in heaven. So that we can pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let that be a prayer for you today as you remember this Resurrection Sunday and you tell someone about what it means to you. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do. We thank you for this glorious, beautiful day. We thank you for the laughter of these children. We thank you for the life that you give us in Christ. We thank you for not giving up on us, but being the God who you are. Faithful, just, and true. But yet, loving, merciful, and kind. To all that will accept you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you and praise you for an empty tomb that gives us the life that we so preciously need in Christ. We thank you and praise you in the name.